Let's discuss some lessons learned and silver linings that have come to my attention, at least during um, this pandemic and being under quarantine for so many days. So let's, the first one is, I mean, as clear as day, right? It's extremely lucid is voting matters. So if you ever needed a stark reminder and you ever wondered why, you know, people vote and you're like, oh, my vote doesn't really matter. It's clear as day that voting matters, right? I mean, if it matters locally um, in your county, as there are certain counties that have taken certain precautions sooner than others and they're doing better nationwide. There's certain governors that have taken um, certain steps or have not taken certain steps that have led to a better or worse response in that state. And then obviously you have the federal government and Trump's bungling of this thing from the beginning. So it's very apparent if it wasn't to you before that voting matters and you need to do your civic duty and vote, just vote. It's not difficult. I mean, in some places I know they try to suppress the vote and I I know how that works. Um, and it's, it's terrible, but what we need to do is collectively, um, you know, make sure that that doesn't happen and where it does happen. We need to just, you need to fight back. You need to just, you need to sometimes, you know, before we can make a change and you're in a predicament like today, for instance, when in Wisconsin with really long lines, you know, you just have to wait it out and, um, it sucks, but it's something we have to do until we can make sure that people's votes aren't being suppressed. Number two, um, we're all in this together, obviously, right? It's very clear that You know, what I do affects my neighbor, Um, what my neighbors do affect my community, what my communities do affect the city I live in and so forth and so on. It's very clear, especially in a time where we're dealing with a virus that's contagious. We're all in this together. We're all connected, um, whether that's, you know, human to human connection in your, you know, your immediate area or via the social media and the internet and how ideas spread and how false information can be spread and how we have to debunk the false information. We're all in this together and we all need to do our part individually so that collectively um, we can, you know, achieve the goals that we want to achieve. Three, um, I think it's it was very apparent to most of us before, but it ought, ought to be even more apparent to a few of the skeptics now that anthropogenic activity is causing uh, massive amounts of pollution and we see that when we pull back like in this quarantine and you see you know photos from satellite images where smog has lifted over certain cities and there's some pretty crazy photos that came out of India um, about the before and after of all the lockdowns and obviously, if we can have that large of effect pollution wise, and the science bears this out anyway, but it's only rational that we can have that large of effect um, on the climate and the temperature itself. So, I mean, that has become extremely apparent um, to me during this during this time. And then another one is our institutions need a, a lot of them need to be completely revamped, updated, or they just need more funding. A lot of the times we will hear people, especially on the right, they'll say like, oh, look, these institutions don't work. You know, the government can't do anything right. Well, part of that is because you're always wanting to cut funding. So if you're always wanting to cut funding and you've cut funding, well, of course they don't work right now because they're not being funded properly. And people aren't being paid what they should be being paid for those jobs. So then they can go out in the private sector and get a much better paying job um, as opposed to going in some in a public sector. So, of course, a lot of these uh, institutions are failing. And then on top of that, a lot of them just need to be updated. I mean, I'm reading absolute horror stories of um, states' unemployment sites, and particularly Florida, and it's just, it's a nightmare. It's an, it's an absolute nightmare. There are people that haven't been able to file for weeks, and they, ha- you know, the first of the month came by and they've had a 
been out of work for maybe three weeks already and they haven't had any income coming in. And this is just a complete failure of the country and our government. And it's, it's insane. Um, and then you even have the stimulus, the CARES Act and the stimulus package that's going out. Um, it's a great thing, but that should have been the, the ironing out the kinks of a bill like that. That should have been in the process weeks, months ago when this pandemic was on the horizon. That's something that the federal government, Congress, Trump, they all could have got together and started, you know, ironing out the kinks and writing the legislation that needs to be put in place so that people don't go without pay for three, four, five weeks. If the bill was already being discussed and already ready to be taken to the floor to be voted on, um, you know, there wouldn't be potentially two months of no income coming in to um, to people in this country who have lost their jobs to no fault of their own. Um, another one is we have to start listening to experts. Right? This is just, this is a complete failure and it's been this way for months and it's been this way for years and, and Trump has just exacerbated this problem and it, it's never been so apparent than now. I've come across a lot of people who have the hubris to think that they know more than uh, certain experts when it comes to any field. And it's beyond comprehension. It's, it's, I don't understand it. Like, I don't know more than the experts on just about anything. So what I, what do I do? I just read what they, what they're saying. I read multiple, uh, articles and then I read the academic papers from experts on said fields getting their opinions from all different angles and then I take the information that they provide and I make my decisions based on what they give that's what you need to do because you're you don't know more than a climatologist than an infectious disease doctor than than you know maybe a, a statistician who's putting all these graphs together you you know you don't know more than these than these people in their fields they've studied this their whole life so what you have to do is just take what they say and gather more information from multiple experts and have the wherewithal and know how to go to the right outlet to go to the right source and to know how to parse through the information and what is a fact, what is opinion and how to fact check those, those statements. But you can't make up your own information and you can't disregard what they're saying when you have no reason to disregard it, when you have no facts of your own to counter what they are saying. Um, it's, it's, it's say it's sad. It's crazy. And it's happening on a massive scale right now. And, and, and at this moment, it's actually leading people to get sick and potentially die. Um, another one is a lot of jobs, obviously, with the, the lockdowns and people being quarantined. A lot of jobs, a lot of employers are probably realizing that some of their, some of their duties can be done from home. People can remote in. And this is a great thing, honestly. You know, it if we can get more people working from working from home, that saves money for the employer. It saves money for the employee. It reduces uh, traffic on the roads, so it saves time there for other people who have to be on the roads. It reduces um, carbon dioxide and pollution in the air because there's not as much car- cars on the road. Uh, the knock-on effects to something like this are just massive, and a lot of them are very beneficial for society as a whole. I mean, you know, if you're an employ- employee who doesn't have to go into work, let's say, you know, you're, you're a 30-year-old woman and you don't have to commute to work anymore, so you probably don't have to buy as many work clothes. You probably don't have to use as much makeup if you're wearing makeup when you go to the office, so you're saving money there. You don't have to buy lunch out, so you're saving money there. You wouldn't have to pack a lunch, so you wouldn't have to wake up earlier, potentially. You wouldn't have to sit in long commutes, so you wouldn't have to wake up earlier. You'd get better rest. You'd be 
we know that more rest and better sleep leads to happier life, leads to a healthier life. I mean, the knock on effects are just down the line. Um, they're great. And on the, on, on the employer side, they don't need as large of a, a footprint anymore. They don't need as large of an office. They don't need as much parking. Um, so they're, they're cutting costs like crazy in these instances. And, um, I mean, those are just great things, um, that we're seeing in terms of being forced into a situation like this. And I think when we come out of it, um, at least I hope that, you know, you will see a lot more people working from home and you'll see a lot of more, a lot more employers willing to hire people, um, str- strictly on a remote basis where they maybe come into the office like once every few months. And, um, it, it could allow for people also to um, really get jobs, um, you know, not with with not within their city, not even within their state, potentially. I mean, if you could get a lot of employers on board and they see the benefits of this, you, you could get a job in, in Ohio and live in Florida, potentially, if you only had to go up there every, you know, every quarter or something like that for, for a quarterly meeting. Um, it would be very beneficial. I mean, I'm sure there's plenty of other uh, lessons learned and silver linings that have come out of this situation. If you can think of any others, leave them down in the comments. Um, If you're enjoying these videos, please remember to like the video, subscribe for more, and uh, thanks for watching.